everyone! My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are getting into a pretty controversial subject within the world of BDSM and that would be financial domination. And wait, stop, get your fingers off that keyboard because I know what you're thinking. You're going, Evie, how could you be talking about financial domination. Isn't that when dominants on the internet steal money from male submissives and like basically abuse them financially? Why would you be talking about this? Isn't this just awful? And that is exactly why I want to cover this area of dominance and power exchange because a lot of people do think that financial domination or FinDom for short is something that only happens when you have a professional, usually female dom, with their submissive, usually male clients, and it's all about the male submissive handing over their credit cards and maxing everything out, totally just getting rid of their life savings, basically, and ruining their family's financial futures for the sake of basically a passing sexual fancy. And I think the ethics of FinDom done in that way are worth considering. I think it doesn't typically go to those extremes, but there are questions that need to be looked into. Like, how can you set up boundaries and limits? How do you negotiate for that? What do you do when your fantasy desires are bigger than your actual wallet? And that is not really what I want to cover today. Now, if that is something that you do want to know about, there is a very well-known author and former pro dom called Princess Kali, who does routinely teach classes about ethical financial domination that is more from that perspective. However, I think there are many other ways that you can engage in FinDom that don't necessarily mean doing anything like that. It might shock you to learn that there are a lot of DS relationships that involve financial domination that do not have either a dominatrix or a pay pig at either end. And I think actually relying on this stereotype of FinDom just looking like an anonymous submissive man on Twitter sending money to a pro dom so they can buy shoes. Like, I think actually looking at it through only that very particular way of doing it can actually be dangerous because then people don't necessarily fully realize what they might be engaging in because, oh, well, it's not like that. And so it can't be as bad, right? It can't be as dangerous. And that is not necessarily the case. It can still be quite risky, even when it doesn't look like, again, that anonymous on Twitter internet arrangement. However, I do not want to start out with the negatives here. I don't think I want to perpetuate any more stigma towards this area of power exchange than is already out there. And I think when you really look into it, a lot of the appeals of financial domination make sense to a lot of people that just enjoy power exchange in BDSM in general. Of course, it does offer that sense of control or being controlled depending on what side of the slash you are on. There is that deeper level of vulnerability that is required of the submissive in order to engage in something like this. And it can also allow you that satisfaction from being able to provide or serve because of your financial means. And of course, just like basically any other kink, there is the potential for this to be some degree of erotically thrilling. One example of financial domination not often labeled as such is the concept of a 24 seven live in submissive or slave. And while this is a fantasy for a lot of people, not many are able to achieve it because it entails the dominant making enough money to be able to fully support two people when the submissive or slave is doing no work outside of the home. They are expected to basically just live 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to serve their partner and not necessarily do anything else to earn money. And because of that, the dominant is in total financial control in that scenario, which also means that they have say over any sort of discretionary spending in the relationship. Now the submissive or the slave 
may be expected to get the dry cleaning and get the groceries and run other errands for which they may be given some kind of card to be able to pay for that out of the dominant's wallet. But when it comes down to the submissive spending money just on themselves, that is something that the dominant typically very closely controls. This usually involves the implementation of an allowance where the dominant gives the submissive a certain amount of money they are allowed to spend on themselves every week or every month. Although even within that, there is usually an additional layer of control because there can be a permission seeking feature where it is expected that when the submissive or slave wants to spend that money, they have to get approval from the dominant first on what it is they're going to be buying, such as choosing to buy the expensive kind of ice cream at the store or getting a manicure. The dominant may either decide they don't want the submissive or slave to spend that money that way, or maybe they have opinions about the flavor of ice cream or the color of the nail polish. Now, this quickly becomes complicated when you have have an S-type that is coming into a relationship like this with any kind of savings or anything sort of in their checking account that they may be able to spend on themselves. And the way that I have usually seen this done when that is the case is everything the submissive has is put into investments and long-term savings and is expected from the time the live-in relationship starts to not spend that money and keep it as a nest egg should anything go wrong or should the submissive have to leave or start working or basically kind of just keeping it there and safe and secure away from the dominant's other finances. Now there are people, especially when this is going along with the married relationship, that fully combine their finances and all of the S-type's previous savings do go into that joint account, though I do think that arrangement is a little bit less common. So while this can appear to create a scenario of dangerous total dependence, I think in most cases there is a safety net involved because you either have that long-term savings in a separate account that only you can touch, or I do know people that take on younger and less experienced submissives who don't typically come in with very many savings to their name. And so as part of their relationship framework, what they do is part of their allowance always goes into a savings account that only the submissive or slave can access. So that way they know that money is safe and they always have something they can start with if the relationship ends or something else happens where they may need to get their own apartment and pay for a security deposit or they need to get their own car, their own transportation, what have you. And I think this is especially common in, for example, the traditional leather lifestyle where ongoing submissive training in a household is more common and it is expected that it will only last for a set amount of time, such as like one year, two years, maybe four years but because it's not based on this promise of like a forever eternal relationship, it is easier to plan for the end of a relationship and make sure that someone is going to have a safer way out into the world again should that end and when it does end. But obviously, this is a pretty advanced form of BDSM and not something I would recommend to beginners because when I have seen it work, the reason why it does is because there is a deep, level of trust in that relationship. They have known each other for a really long time. They are typically in a long-term relationship, if not outright married, and they can rely on that deep bond to create the security necessary to engage in something like this. Whereas if you don't have that trust already, you are taking a very, very big risk. Even someone that promises you the world and says all the right things, they could have very bad intentions. They could steal your identity and open up 10 credit cards in your name. They could drain your bank account and then ghost you. Or at the very least, even in the best case scenario at minimum, you are left with a potentially several year gap on your resume that is very difficult to explain because unfortunately most companies do not take 24 seven servitude as a transferable skill. That doesn't mean though that only the truest, most domly dom doms can participate in financial domination. There are definitely ways to engage in this that can happen at a lower level of DS that doesn't require you even necessarily live with the partner. So for example, let's take a look again at allowances, which I mentioned before. 
for people that have a DDLG or a caregiver little based relationship, allowances are a really common feature, even when the submissive does make their own money because people that are in CGL relationships, typically there is a caregiver and provider role to that. And part of that providing can be wanting to have this role play of being given money by the caregiver and having this mental framework of like, this isn't really my money, they're giving it to me and I'm allowed to spend it because I'm a good girl or I'm a good boy. And this can actually be used to reinforce the relationship because it can be used as a tool alongside other rules. So for example, maybe if the little has an allowance, they might want to go to the store and get their favorite kind of unicorn pudding. And maybe before they do that, they have to check in with their dominant partner before they buy it because they have that permission seeking feature. And maybe the dominant is only ever going to say yes because it's not their money to control, but they might also say, you know, instead of getting the pudding, I think you should buy some crackers or treat yourself to some ice cream or whatever else you know you can have that variation in the relationship it can also be used as a reward so if the little does very well on an important test or gets praise at work maybe that means that their allowance gets a nice little bonus to it for the next week but of course it is not just ddlg or cgl that can combine financial domination with role play Another popular choice here is 1950s households, especially if the submissive in the relationship is a woman because it can be fun to play with that trope of the kept housewife. Now it could very well be the case that the submissive partner actually has their own business or telecommutes or works part-time or even as a doctor and makes twice as much money as the dominant, whatever scenario it may be, but it can still be fun to play with those traditional gender roles, so to speak, and play along with the idea that, you know, she might make $100,000 a year, but actually she really needs to have dear husband or dear wife's permission before spending money on her hobbies. And I think this can actually be an inverse of the typical fin dom arrangement where the stereotype we have in our heads is that, oh, fin dom is when you have a male submissive paying for a female dominant, where in this relationship, it can be the case that it's actually the male dominant that is taking care of the female submissive. Maybe they want to make sure their partner always has some fun money on hand for getting her hair done and maintaining a manicure and buying a nice lingerie to wear before their next date night. It can be that kind of doting, almost paternal sort of role play in terms of like, here you go, sweet cake here's 20 bucks don't spend it all in one place you know that <laughs> that kind of thing um, which can actually be a lot of fun and for the dominant can help fulfill that provider role that they might actually get a lot of enjoyment out of even without an overarching role play framework a lot of people do like to have elements of financial domination in their power exchange relationships so you might have a live-in relationship together and you might have a DS relationship together but you might also work both outside of the home, making your own money, and then share finances. In that scenario, it could be the case that the dominant has final say over any major purchases in the home and is the one who makes sure that the bills all get paid. Now, this might sound very much like everyday normal life stuff that vanilla couples have to do, and that's kind of because that's the case. Not everything you do in a 24-7 relationship will be maximum kink, BDSM fun times the whole way through. Sometimes you have to think about how in a power exchange relationship you would handle vanilla things going on. Like who's the one who pays for the electric bill? Do you split the cost of internet? Does that even matter? And if you go about this process with the correct intention, things that could just be like boring vanilla slogs could be something that served to reinforce and remind both of you of your dynamic, which actually on sort of a tangent note here, I wanna bring us to the question, a very tricky question of who pays for dinner. <laughs> the most vanilla thing you could think of because no matter where you are in the world, 
there is some kind of expectation of how dinner is meant to be paid for. For some places, it is that the man should always pay for the whole meal. Some places, it's whoever invites the other person to dinner. In some places, it's always split down the middle and it can really depend. And depending on your BDSM relationship, you might handle going to dinner and who pays as a kind of small, subtle form of financial domination. So for some people, there is the expectation that the male submissive will pay for the female dominant or the male dominant will pay for a female submissive as a way of demonstrating their ability to provide and taking on an authoritative caretaker role. Yet in other scenarios, people decide that paying for meals is an egalitarian part of their relationship and they don't do anything DS related to it at all and they just split it down the middle and that's what they both want. So again, this goes to show that depending on your intention, something can either be egalitarian and vanilla or be something that is a low level form of findom in your dynamic. So I think this goes to show once again, how important intention can be when it comes to if something is kinky or not. It can be something that creates a low level form of financial domination in your relationship or it can be kept egalitarian and no BDSM is ever involved. However, unlike in vanilla relationships, I do really think that regardless of what you want to do, it should be something that you negotiate for first instead of waiting for the check to arrive and then just assuming what's going to happen before ever talking about it. That is definitely an awkward scenario to land in, especially when you are on a date with a dom. Now, I will also just quickly mention here, I have seen some other kind of lesser known forms of potential domination in people's relationships. So for example, I do know one scenario where it is actually the live-in 24-7 submissive that goes outside the home and works, and it's the dominant that stays home because they have a chronic health condition. And so doing the work is a form of service, and the money actually goes entirely to the dominant's account to spend at their their discretion. I do also know some dominant men supposedly expect submissive women to pay for meals as a sign of their devotion to the relationship, but both of these are fairly uncommon, but it can happen. You can make financial domination look any way you want to. It is not just Findom as presented on the internet and that is the only option and the only ways that people do things. Now, this was simply my ideas of what I thought you could do to have this be part of a DS relationship that goes against the stereotype. But I would love to hear from you all down below what some of your thoughts and ideas are around this. If you have ways of incorporating financial control into your relationships, that's not something that I mentioned here stories about if it worked for you or if it didn't, I would love to know again what you all think in a comment down below. And I do just want to quickly clarify, I do think the term findom is pretty strongly correlated with the, again, the idea of the online pro-dom getting money from a male submissive as opposed to being a more general term. I do think the term financial domination or control is going to kind of open up more of the possibilities of all types of incorporating money into your DS relationship, into your power exchange, if you want to explore this more and are looking for terminology to use there. But with all of that being said, once again, I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions down below in a comment. If you have not already and you would like to, please go ahead and subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is with Patreon. A link to that will be down down below. If you do already support over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.